The first thing we need to do, if we're going to start to understand flowing water, is to be able to come up with some essential flow parameters to describe the flow. Consider a flowing stream. Can you think of a short list of the most essential ways in which you would quantify what's going on here? The challenge with natural streams is that they are extremely complex, so are difficult to measure and quantify in any simple way. So, to make life easier, I built this model flume in my office at home to help us investigate these parameters more easily. The flume has a near perfect rectangular cross section and is small enough so that I can easily control and manipulate the flow conditions in a way that would be almost impossible for a natural stream. This is in essence what most laboratory scientific experiments are. Models of the real world that are realistic enough to simulate interesting processes, but are simple enough to be able to easily control, manipulate and quantify. My flume is 150 millimetres wide, and we're going to call its width B. We'll also call the depth of water in the flume Y, and lengths along the longitudinal axis X. So now let's start thinking about our fundamental parameters. The single most important parameter when considering moving water is the discharge, sometimes referred to as the flow rate. The discharge is the volume of water passing through a system in a given time. If we consider a stream and imagine that 100 litres was passing a point in this stream every second, the discharge would be 100 litres per second, meaning that for every second the system is running, 100 litres is passing through it. We'll denote discharge with the letter Q. Mathematically, we can calculate discharge by dividing the volume passing through a system by the amount of time it has taken for that volume to pass through. The official SI units for discharge are meters cubed per second, but we often quote this parameter in liters per second for convenience. So being able to convert between liters and meters cubed is an essential skill in hydraulics. So if we consider a flow in my flume, to measure the discharge, all we need to do is time how long it takes to collect a certain volume, and then divide that volume by the time. Here I'm collecting water in a jug, and timing how long it takes to fill that volume of a stopwatch. In this example, I've collected about 0.95 litres in just over 3 seconds. I'm going to round these numbers to make our life simpler. So to calculate the discharge, I simply have to divide the volume by the time. We collected 0.95 litres and it took 3 seconds to collect that volume. So if we divide the volume by the time, we get a discharge of 0.32 litres per second. Meaning 0.32 litres is passing through the flume every second. We can convert this into metres cubed per second by dividing the final answer by 1000, as there is a thousand litres in a metre cubed. The discharge is probably the single most important parameter in hydraulics, as this is telling us actually how much water is passing through any system in a given period of time. It is almost always the starting point when considering or designing a flow. However, by itself, it's not sufficient to fully describe a flow. For example, let's consider our stream. These two videos were taken just a few metres apart. It's reasonable to assume over such a short reach, the discharge will not have changed significantly. The amount of water going down the stream per unit time is most likely constant here. Yet the flow is almost unrecognisable between these two shots. Similarly in my flume, the discharge is always constant. There's a pipe supplying the flume that's fed from a pump at a constant discharge of 0.32 litres per second. 
Therefore, within reason, we know that there will always be 0.32 litres going down the flume every second, as this pipe is constantly supplying this discharge. The discharge will not change for any of the shots I present in this sequence. However, by playing with the setup, I can make the flow look like this, or this, or even this. All of these shots have exactly the same discharge, but they're clearly not the same in terms of how the water is behaving. So we need some more terms to help us differentiate further. Just pause for a second to consider what other two parameters we could use to differentiate between these cases. The second parameter is the flow's primary velocity. This is how fast the water in the system is moving in the x-direction, and is defined as the distance the water has travelled over the time it took to travel that distance. You might think of a car as travelling at 30 km per hour, meaning in an hour it will travel 30 km. Similarly, we think of flowing water in terms of how many metres it has travelled in a certain period of time. One metre per second means the water will travel one metre in one second. So, if we measure how long it took an object moving at the speed of our flow to travel a certain distance, from this data we could calculate the velocity of the flow simply by dividing the distance travelled by the time taken. In this example, it took approximately 2 seconds for the object to travel 0.3 metres. So, if we know the velocity is distance travelled over time, and the object travelled 0.3 metres in 2 seconds, by entering these terms into our equation, we get a velocity of 0.15 metres per second. This is not a particularly accurate way to measure the velocity for a flow, and we will discuss why this is the case in later lessons but it will do for a very crude estimate of the flow's mean velocity to demonstrate the point. So the water flowing in our flume can travel at different velocities, sometimes fast, sometimes slow. Similarly for a real stream or river, sometimes the flow is fast, sometimes slow. So we can see that velocity is a really useful way to differentiate between different flows. The final parameter to consider is the flow's cross-sectional area. This is the area taken up by the flow's cross-section. Exactly how we define this term depends on the geometry of the flow, but for a simple rectangular flow like my flume, it would be the width of the channel times by the flow depth. So, if the depth of water in the flume is 17 millimetres, and we know the flume is 150 millimetres wide, we could calculate the area by timesing these two numbers together, remembering to convert all lengths into metres first. This gives us an area in this example of 0.00255 metres squared. Again, in our different cases, we can see that the flow in the flume can either have a large area, or a small area. And this is exactly the same for our real stream, 
In this shot the area is low and the velocity is high, whereas in this shot the area is high and the velocity is low. So now we have the three essential parameters needed to describe at a basic level what is going on in any flow. We know that the flow will have a discharge, a velocity and a cross-sectional area and that the velocity and the area seem to be related so that if one is high the other is low and vice versa. At some level this is fairly intuitive but to be able to work precisely with our flow parameters we need to show this relationship between discharge, velocity and area exactly and mathematically. So let's have a look at how to do that. We know that discharge is volume passing through a system in a given time, velocity is distance travelled in x over time, and area is the width of the channel times by the flow depth. So the discharge is how much water has passed a certain point in a certain period of time. Imagine for a moment what that would look like in a flow. We can do that by considering the volume of water passing the dashed red line in the diagram. How would we calculate the flow from this diagram? It would be the volume over time and the volume that has passed the red dashed line is the width of the channel times by the length of the volume that has passed the red line times by the flow depth. So the discharge being volume over time is actually the same thing as the channel width times by the flow depth times by the distance over time. If we look at this equation we can clearly see that the first half is the same definition as the definition of cross-sectional area and the second half is the same definition as velocity. So we can actually redefine our discharge as cross-sectional area times by velocity. This is possibly the single most important equation in hydraulics and we will use it almost continuously throughout almost every lesson that will follow. If you want to make progress with hydraulics, you need to have Q equals UA firmly ingrained in your mind. The reason this equation is so important is because it tells us that the discharge is linearly related to the velocity in the cross-sectional area. For many systems over a short period of time, as we've already mentioned, we can assume that the discharge is fixed. And a great example of this is my flume, as the pump is always supplying a constant volume per unit time. So if the discharge is fixed, that means if we increase the velocity, the area must decrease. Or if we decrease the velocity, the area must increase and so on and so forth. If either the velocity or the area increase or decrease, the other must do the opposite to conserve mass. Now we have the basic tools to understand what is going on in the flume across the different examples I showed earlier. The discharge is always the same, but if I force the velocity or the cross-sectional area to change, this will have an effect on the other parameter. As one goes up, the other goes down. For example, the flow here starts at the depth 5 marked. But if I increase the gradient of the flume, the effect of gravity will force the velocity of the water to increase, and as such, the area must decrease to conserve discharge, which is constant. Or, if we consider the flume flowing unconstrained, we can see that the area is quite low and the velocity is quite high. But if I build a weir at the downstream end, this forces the area of the flow to increase, which in turn forces the velocity to decrease to conserve discharge. Finally, if we add some large obstacles to the flow, this forces the area to decrease and as we can see from these particles, it forces the velocity to increase. 
The same principle is why in just over a few meters in the stream that we looked at in the last video, we see such a large variety of flow types. The water in this shot is coming over an extremely steep gradient, which is forcing the velocity of the water to increase, which means in turn, the area of the flow must decrease. Similarly in this shot, the rocks are forcing the area of the flow to decrease, which means that the velocity must increase. And finally, as the slope of the river flattens out, this allows the velocity to decrease, which forces the area to increase. We can see this process getting more pronounced as the river makes its way towards its estuary. Hopefully we can see that by being able to define these three essential parameters, we can begin to describe what we are seeing when we observe moving water, and start to think of how we could design a system at a given discharge to give us either the velocity we want, or the area we want. So in this video we've looked at the three parameters that we need to describe a flow, and the equations that we need to calculate them. In the next video we're going to look at the assumptions that we need to make and understand in order to be able to apply those equations accurately. So hopefully see you then.